right now, guys. Coming this way. Hundreds of people spot UFOs all around the world. Please, really Most can be explained and dismissed. But remarkable videotaped evidence and credible eyewitness accounts of three recent sightings in Texas, Massachusetts, and Indiana prompt a thorough investigation with surprising conclusions. These people saw something. Stephenville, Texas, January 8, 2008. Businessman and private pilot Steve Allen is just outside of town when he spots something curious in the sky. I look off to the east and I see a, a series of lights coming at us real quick. Steve describes enormous blue, red, and white lights flying in formation at high velocity. The lights stop on a dime and hover over the nearby Erath County Courthouse. What was remarkable about the lights was they was all moving in unison. At the same time, 20 miles to the west in Dublin, Texas, Constable Leroy Gaydon watches the unusual activity of the flying lights. They had to have been attached to something because it was like a school of fish. They all shot off at the same speed at the same time. Steve Allen sees the bizarre lights move in the shape of an arc, then align vertically. About two seconds later, they broke apart and had two sets of seven lights flashing. Suddenly, the two separate sets of lights vanish in an instant. But there's a third credible witness, an Erath County police officer with over 20 years of service. He asks that his identity not be revealed. I was traveling on um, Highway 377 south loop through Stephenville, and I noticed uh, some movement in the sky near the Erath County Courthouse. He watches a large eight-sided object with bright blue lights hover above the courthouse. The officer estimates the UFO to be approximately 600 feet long and 400 feet wide. He attempts to lock his patrol car radar gun on the craft to track its speed. I reached up, hit the switch, and got locked. For the radar gun to lock, the outgoing beam must hit a solid surface and be reflected back. To indicate his speed, the targeted object has to be moving. The rebound of the signal comes back into the unit off an object that I have pointed the radar at. It locked in very quickly. According to the officer, the radar gun shows the craft is moving at a steady 27 miles per hour. Then, the craft begins to maneuver. Here is when it started to, to do its 45 degree flying. The craft flies off at a low altitude, and the patrol officer loses it behind the tree. As it was pulling away, it accelerated up to 33 miles an hour. It was getting out of range of my radar, and that's when I lost the lock. Back on the east side of Stephenville, Steve Allen watches a set of lights coming back across the sky from the other end of town with two F-16s on its tail. They was definitely in pursuit. Same heading, same course as whatever the other craft was. I think it appeared like they was just trying to stay with it or catch it, but they wasn't having much luck. The next morning, Steve Allen calls Angela Joyner, a reporter at the local Stephenville newspaper. Steve Allen said there were two F-16s chasing this thing that came over him. So there was a lot of talk about the military traffic. I started calling around different bases, trying to find out something. Angela contacts the nearby Naval Air Station Joint Reserve Base at Fort Worth, formerly Carswell Air Force Base. 
she speaks with the base public affairs officer. And he says, no, we didn't have any F-16s in the area. The public affairs officer gives Angela and the public the military's first explanation for the strange lights. They conclude they were caused by the sun reflecting off two commercial airliners flying at high altitude. I said, the reflection off of my shiny white ass is what it was. It wasn't no high altitude jet airliners. Jet airliners usually don't have two F-16s chasing them at 1,000 foot above the ground. Word of the sighting spreads. And now, with national media asking questions, the NASJRB Public Affairs Office lays out a second explanation. About two weeks later, they sent out a press release and it basically said, sorry, we made a mistake. We actually had 10 F-16s in your area from 6 to 8 p.m. on January the 8th. Why the complete reversal of the military's claim that there were no F-16s in the area at the time of the sightings? More questions and suspicions begin to rise. And it really made them angry. A lot of people felt that was put out as a cover-up. Did the witnesses in Erath County see just F-16s? The reflections of high-flying commercial airliners? Or something truly unexplained? The Department of Defense turned down requests for interviews with any of the F-16 pilots based at the NAS JRB Fort Worth and no photo or video evidence surfaces to support the witness reports. But a month later, Constable Gaten gets his evidence. In February, he and his wife Wendy photographed a strange bright light over Stephenville. It was about 9.30, 10. We were on the way home and um, we saw the light in the sky. So I just kind of leaned over on the window and just started taking pictures. Wendy's photos are the first images of the type of lights witnesses had also seen racing over Erath County the previous month. I was amazed at what I saw. The colors of it, it was red and green and blue and white. The pictures were just amazing. Hours later that same night, Constable Gaten, patrolling Stephenville in his cruiser, also sees the light. He powers up his dashboard-mounted video camera and presses record. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was attached to or what. On the video, I can't tell. In the weeks following the Texas sightings, a radar expert analyzes air traffic control radar data and finds something unusual. January 8, 2008, dozens of Central Texas residents, including police officers, spotted strange objects maneuvering erratically in the night sky. Local military officials claimed that nothing more than fighter aircraft on routine training missions were in the air that night. But witnesses took the official explanation with a grain of salt. A lot of people felt that was put out as a cover-up. Without any video or photographic imagery to support the witnesses of the January 8th sighting, radar expert Glenn Schultz turns to the FAA. He files a Freedom of Information Act request for radar records of that night. His goal is to determine if anything out of the ordinary occurred in the night skies. Schultz breaks down the FAA radar data and constructs a 100-mile by 100-mile cube of airspace above Stephenville from ground level to 41,000 feet. Inside of that cube, I looked at every antenna return that fell inside of there. An antenna return appeared whenever the FAA radar antenna detected something in the sky. Analyzing those antenna returns, Schultz tracks the path of the 10 F-16 fighters that the military claims were in the area at the time of the sightings. 
Schultz's analysis confirms their story to a point. But Schultz also finds something else in the sky with those F-16s. Three unknown objects flying together over Stephenville. They shared the characteristic of what I call erratic uh, flight patterns. These targets would speed along at a fairly rapid speed and then it would stop. For a 10 or 30 second period, we might have no forward motion of these unknowns and then suddenly they would start moving again. And when they started moving, uh, sometimes their speeds got up to several hundred miles per hour. Schultz's scrutiny of the FAA records reveals that the speed, location, and movement of these three unknowns corroborates what Steve Allen saw that night. The antenna return data shows two crafts flying away from the county courthouse. And a third craft being chased by two F-16s minutes later. In my opinion, these three targets acting in such erratic speed profiles and where they were with regard to the Stephenville area and the time of night that they were present indicated to me that these unknown targets were responsible in part for what the eyewitnesses were seeing. Schultz's radar findings suggest the F-16s were on military exercises. But the data shows that when the jets finished their training mission and turned back toward their base at Carswell Field, they abruptly split up. Six of them followed the prescribed military training route centerline back to Carswell. Four did not, and their return stood out like gangbusters because they veered to the east by 25 to 30 miles off of the center line of the military training route. This change of course would place the F-16s directly in the area where Steve Allen saw them chasing the unidentified flying object. The question arises as to why these four jets would veer off, of course. One theory is that the pilots were just hot rodding. I don't think that was the case. I think they were more likely ordered from their ground commanding operations to do some inspection 20 to 30 miles east of Stephenville. Schultz's findings received no official acknowledgement from the military. Two months later and 1,800 miles away, a nearly identical sighting mystifies eyewitnesses. Southwick, Massachusetts, April 18, 2008. Dan Vierno, a musician, is at home when his girlfriend spots something through the kitchen window. A good 10, 15 minutes later, she's just, you know, edging me to come out there. She's like, seriously, you got to come out here and take a look at this. Stepping out his front door, he watches a glowing orb float just above the horizon, radiating brilliant colors. Scanning the sky, he sees even more of the bright orbs. He grabs his camcorder and starts shooting the brightest light. When I started filming it, it was actually near the end where it was just starting to go behind the horizon. Dan's neighbor, Kathy Hubbard, also sees the lights. The longer we watched it, the more frightened we became, the more concerned we became, and we knew that it was real. These did not move smooth across the sky, up, down, sideways, and they moved very quick. And they did come near each other numerous times and then go away again. You know, trail of the stars. A fourth witness, Courtney Lynn Wilson Merrill, observes the same lights. There were three lights, but they were spread apart. There was one here, and then there was one right behind me, and then one in that direction. The lights in the sky didn't make any sort of noise. There weren't any military jets chasing it or anything. Courtney is a professional photographer, and she focuses her video camera on the brightest object. Were they in triangle formation? It started down here. Were they making patterns? Here. Yes, they were. She sets her camera for a short time exposure to better capture the light's erratic path. What I wanted to do is if it was moving, it would create a little light trail. 
This image records the light's path for 15 seconds. You see the object move slightly with the stars and then dip down, stop, and then move with the stars again. So you have the two trails and then the little stair step down. My first thought that it was a ship, that it was some sort of ship, it, whether aliens or extraterrestrials or the military or whatever, it was definitely man-made. It wasn't anything natural. Like the earlier Texas incidents, air traffic control radar data could help investigators form a clearer picture of what happened in the skies above Southwick. But a request for radar records at the time of the sightings turns up nothing. The FAA explains they have no records relevant to that event. The similarity of the images of the lights recorded in Texas and later in Massachusetts draws the attention of retired fighter pilot and aviation investigator David Kennedy. Could the two sightings in very distant cities be of the same thing? This is a very similar light pattern to what we saw in Stephenville, Texas. It appears to pulse just like the Stephenville uh, illumination did. Kennedy then looks for any indication that the light is something conventional, routine, explainable. It doesn't look like an aircraft landing light or any kind of aircraft position lights. With a limited look at color on this, it does not appear to have the intensity of a target illumination flare, which is a white hot magnesium. It doesn't have the short duration of a decoy flare. I've never seen anything like this. And frankly, I've talked to some of my friends and said, do you know anything that we're working on that this might be? And, and they draw a blank as well. Kennedy's analysis suggests the light spotted over Texas and the one seen in Massachusetts could be the same object. Then reports of a third incredible sighting surface. Two days earlier, April 16, 2008, 800 miles west of Southwick, residents of Kokomo, Indiana, marvel at strange formations of lights in the night sky. They're then suddenly rattled by a ground-shaking boom that's heard all across town. That night, Sergeant Richard Ferguson, a Howard County Sheriff, is on duty near Kokomo. April 16th was not, it, it started out as a very normal, quiet day and turned into absolute chaos in a matter of, of minutes. You came right to our window. Oh, it's coming over the house right now, guys. It's coming this way. It was an absolute crazy night. 911. Your phone's calling. I heard uh, an explosion. Yeah. We've got officers trying to find it. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. The Howard County 911 Emergency Call Center lights up with hundreds of calls. As I'm heading back toward town, we started getting more and more reports to this bright light in the sky and four other uh, different colored lights around it. Kokomo residents armed with video cameras capture the mysterious images. You see it? Oh my gosh! What is that? Hank Bolger is a retired Howard County detective and an Air Force veteran. He's at home when he hears the boom and rushes outside. Bolger watches as five orange lights form a straight line each light shifting to the left as a new one appears. These were just aligned in a row, and I, I couldn't see anything else around it. It didn't go up, it didn't go down, it just, it was gone, just in a flash. Sergeant Ferguson, getting reports from the 911 dispatchers, assumes the callers have seen a mid-air collision and explosion. He contacts the Indiana Air National Guard at Fort Wayne Airport and asks if any of their aircraft are flying in the area. I'd find out exactly what was going on. So when I talked to those folks up there, our tires closed, uh, our planes are down, we don't have anybody up. Minutes after the boom, Dustin Cronkite sees something that contradicts what Sheriff Ferguson has just been told. 
I discovered that there were probably 14 to 16 airplanes, possibly jets, flying around in the same circular direction, which then got me to notice that there was a strange pattern of lights that were lighting up in the sky. Dustin reports seeing a bright, strobing light shooting off intense colors. He photographs it. I noticed that a lot of the lights in the sky were banding off on my camera. They're kind of doing like a rainbow pattern. It was just kind of all over my camera with all the red, the blues, the greens, and the purples, just all different kind of lights that you don't really see ordinarily at night in the sky. In one of his photos, Dustin captures lights in the shape of what he sees as a disc-shaped craft. It was uh, almost as if it was like a circular structure that was stationary in the sky that I'd photographed. Seconds later, the craft disappears. The lights vanish and the sky is quiet again. But what remains is a puzzling record of photos, video images, and plenty of witnesses who heard a thunderously loud boom. We just heard a big explosion that shook our house. Right, we were, we're already aware of it. What could have generated a boom loud enough to shake roofs and rattle windows across several square miles? Sergeant Ferguson searched and found no evidence of a crash site, an impact crater, or an explosion. Perhaps the boom was caused by an aircraft flying supersonically and breaking the sound barrier. Or perhaps it was caused by something natural, such as a meteor. Okay, coming up on the outskirts of Kokomo. And it's a gorgeous day for flying. Glenn Means is a retired Air Force Special Operations aviator. He's searching for evidence that a meteor caused the lights and boom over Kokomo. If it was a meteor, it would have had to be fairly substantial for people from two counties away to hear it. And again, if it was a meteor and it exploded in midair, there would be a debris field, there would be holes in the ground, there would be holes in roofs and in cars. Glenn and his pilot scan the farm fields for any damage. So far, I'm not seeing any scarring, I'm not seeing any debris, I'm not seeing any holes in the ground. But then, Glenn sees something. Three, two, one, mark, crater at three o'clock. I think we found it. Yep, there it is. It looks to be about eight to 10 feet across, and I would say it's at least eight feet deep, probably more since there's water in the base of the crater. Good job. Back on the ground, Glenn heads to the crater for a closer look. If it is a meteor crater, it's a major breakthrough. What we found out from talking with the farmer involved was that he has a broken drain tile. Unfortunately, it was not a crater caused by a meteorite or anything else falling from the sky. This undermines the meteor theory. Looking at the evidence that we have in this case, if a meteor did vaporize and explode and cause a boom over Kokomo, there's, uh, there's no evidence that we can find to support that. His findings are significant. Not locating an impact crater makes it unlikely that a meteor broke the sound barrier and created the boom. The next day, the 122nd Fighter Wing of the Indiana Air National Guard issued a statement. It explained that one of their F-16 fighter jets accidentally broke the sound barrier over Kokomo while deploying anti-missile flares. This raised suspicions for Sergeant Ferguson. He recalled that immediately after the boom, he spoke with the 122nd Fighter Wing and was told all of their planes were on the ground. A follow-up request for further clarification from the Fighter Wing was denied by the Pentagon. Being around the aircraft in this area, I, I am not buying into the, the aircraft story. It just doesn't add up. Are they just trying to hide something? There wasn't a jet engine going by. There wasn't anything that was just rumbling. You couldn't tell what the boom was. That's what made it so peculiar. These did not appear to be any flares that I've ever witnessed or seen before. But days after the fighter wing's reversal, 
new video surfaces. Imagery that may support the Air Force's version of events. Amateur filmmaker J.T. Putterbaugh had reported seeing dozens of strange lights in the sky north of Kokomo. When I saw that, I was basically like, you know, what's going on? That kind of freaked me out a little bit, but at the same time, I was intrigued by it. He captures the lights, downloads the footage into his computer, and notices something unusual. I noticed there's a little blinking light. I turned the exposure up, and I could see that there was at least an object with a blinking light shooting these things out. Retired Navy F-18 pilot David Kennedy analyzes JT's footage. What you're going to see is a classic example of an F-16 uh, dispensing decoy flares in a sequence. What you'll see is the picture get much brighter, and it's very, very obvious. You can see the flares actually coming out of the aircraft. This is a military training maneuver beyond a doubt. Kennedy then compares JT's footage to video shot by other eyewitnesses that night. This piece of video is very interesting. Uh, taken by a mom with her uh, handheld camera looking west from Kokomo, Indiana into the night sky. That tells me with a pretty good sense of certainty that this is an F-16 putting out expendables in a tactical training environment in a tactical training profile. Kennedy's analysis reveals the lights in these two videos were created by F-16s. But it doesn't explain several other videos, eyewitness accounts, and photos that captured a disc-shaped object in the skies over Kokomo. Did an F-16 generate the sonic boom? It's possible. But during training missions, F-16 pilots are expressly prohibited from flying supersonically over populated areas. It's a very serious violation to do a sonic boom in an area where you're not supposed to. It's a violation of air discipline. An aircraft flying supersonically above 761 miles per hour compresses the air around it so much it forms a shock wave. In addition to creating a loud boom, this shock wave can shake roofs, shatter windows, and damage structures. It was pretty loud. It was like it rumbled everything, but there was nothing after that. There wasn't a jet engine going by. You couldn't tell what the boom was. That's what made it so peculiar. It scared me. My house shook, my windows rattled, and it just really scared me. Glenn Means is a retired Air Force Special Operations aviator. We're standing at ground zero of Kokomo Boom. We've determined by talking to witnesses and doing triangulation that this is probably where the boom originated, overhead. Glenn estimates the boom was centered five miles southwest of Kokomo. This location is still several miles away from the Hilltop Military Operations Area, the only area where 122nd Fighter Wing F-16s are authorized to conduct training missions subsonically. Glenn and other investigators canvass the adjacent area. They speak with 33 residents living within a square mile of the boom's epicenter. Got some you just heard this huge boom, and you said you thought that a plane might have crashed? Right. Witness reports indicate the boom was several times louder than a normal F-16 sonic boom. An F-16 flying at Mach 1 would create a sonic boom around 140 decibels, about as loud as a gunshot at close range. But witness reports after the Kokomo boom describe a thunderous sound, so powerful it shakes roofs and almost breaks household windows. One witness claimed to have seen an F-16 in the sky at the time of the incident. But nine of the witnesses claim to have seen strange lights in the sky. Radar data obtained from the FAA shows several F-16s over Kokomo at the time of the boom. This data supports the military story. But the radar recordings also show an unidentified object flying in the airspace. This substantiates the eyewitness reports. 
Dustin Cronkite claims he saw several F-16s circling the disc-shaped craft just before it flew off at a high rate of speed and disappeared. This raises one key question. Did an F-16 produce the boom reported by witnesses and military officials? Or could it have been the disc-shaped craft Dustin reported seeing? Dr. Scott Miller is professor and chairman of aerospace engineering at Wichita State University and a fellow at the National Institute for Aviation Research. He's designed an experiment to determine whether a disc-shaped craft can generate a sonic boom louder than an F-16. Dr. Miller and his team will test two scale models in a supersonic wind tunnel. An F-16 like the ones flown by the 122nd fighter wing. And a disc-shaped craft similar to what Dustin Cronkite photographed in the skies over Kokomo. Using Schlieren imagery, observers can see how air of different densities flows around an object. Dr. Miller and his team will be able to see the shock waves the F-16 and the disc generate as they travel through the air at over twice the speed of sound. They'll be looking closely at the size of each craft's shock wave. The craft that generates the bigger shock wave will produce the louder sonic boom. Five, four, three, two, one. Seen in this replay, the Schlieren imagery clearly captures the shock waves generated by the F-16 as it flies supersonically. Dr. Miller and his team review the results. These are results uh, obtained by testing this F-16 model. Interestingly, you can see, even see a shock wave that's forming on the top part of the vertical surface here. Eventually, they'll combine, and what we'll see is that on the ground, there'll be two very major noticeable shock waves that will intersect with the ground. If you were underneath the airplane as it flew over, you would hear the effect of the first and the second shock. In all likelihood, it's going to be perceived as a single boom, just because those two shocks are very, very close to each other. Now, the disc. Five, four, three, two, one. Actually, all know that that's a good. Dr. Miller good analyzes the images. Because see, we're getting a good. This is a, a photograph of a recent run, and uh, the flow is fully established at Mach, in this case, 2.2. The most prominent shock wave you see is the one that's coming off of the nose. Uh, you see another small one that's coming off the little spherical surface that sits on the top of the disc. After reviewing the two shock wave profiles, Dr. Miller shares his findings. In looking at the Schlieren photographs for these two models, uh, this one's going to create a louder boom. Uh, and part of the reason for that is it's got more volume to it. And obviously, when you look at the intensity of the shock waves in the Schlieren photos, the disc generated a greater intensity, higher strength nose shock and tail shock. So uh, this one would sound very loud. At supersonic speeds, the disc generated a larger shock wave than the F-16. The results suggest if an F-16 and a disc were flying in the same airspace, the disc would make a louder sonic boom than an F-16. Investigators have been unable to find any recording of the actual boom over Kokomo. Until one is found and analyzed, the wind tunnel results open the possibility that a disc-shaped object could have caused the extra loud boom heard over Kokomo. It does not rule out that an F-16 caused the boom. However, Numerous credible witnesses reported seeing something very different from an F-16, and many of their photos and videos show an object unlike any known military aircraft. Coming up, 
An aviation photography analyst attempts to replicate eyewitness photos and videos. Early in 2008, strange flying lights and unknown craft mystified scores of witnesses in Texas, Massachusetts, and Indiana. A few managed to grab their cameras and photograph the fleeting objects. I noticed all the pictures had like just a band of lights that was just stretching all the way across the screen on my camera. I sort of came to my senses and said, oh, I have my camera with me, and that's when I started shooting. Could recording something routine, like military or commercial aircraft, have created these unusual images? To answer that riddle, Craig Schmidtman, a professional aviation photographer, has devised a test. Craig has gathered the same type of cameras used by the witnesses and from a vantage point at Los Angeles International Airport, he will be photographing approaching and departing aircraft. He will use a number of settings on each camera to see if he can replicate the mysterious string lights and other phenomena seen in the eyewitness videos. So the camera I've been shooting with so far tonight is a mid-level professional digital SLR from one of the major brands. It's about eight megapixel resolution, and from what we understand, it's almost identical in performance to the cameras used in Texas and Massachusetts. A critical factor in Craig's experiment is shutter speed. The longer a camera's shutter remains open, the more light is allowed in. This is vital for capturing objects in low light. But the longer the shutter remains open, the more fast-moving objects will appear to streak across the frame. In order to do um, the sort of things that might represent the imagery we saw out of Texas, uh, I've gone from one half a second all the way out to four seconds in order to expose the imaging system of this camera uh, for varying lengths of time so we'd have shorter and longer streaks of light, trying to see if we could get the rainbows and flares and all these other artifacts that we've seen in the other photographs. At his studio, Craig begins his analysis. First, looking at the photo shot by Wendy Gayton in Texas. I find this image a bit of a mystery, actually. We have this rainbow effect throughout the image, which leads me to think that either the source was changing color or there's a distortion caused by some other force that we're not really familiar with. Craig compares her photo to one he shot of a commercial airliner using a camera like Wendy's. There's nothing close to the rainbow we see throughout the image from Wendy in Texas. While this is certainly an aircraft, I can't say that that's what this is. Even though he applied a variety of different settings, Craig could not recreate the translucent rainbow coloring in Wendy's photos and Dustin's photos from Indiana. Similar but we don't have anywhere near the rainbow effect that we're seeing on Dustin's photograph. We have a streak, we have a streak of almost the same length, but nowhere does this image look at all to me like the image that was sent to us from Dustin. Next, Craig looks at Courtney Lynn Wilson Merrill's photo of the light in Massachusetts. We see a bit of an orange, well, it's more of a magenta really glow around the outside of it, and there's a little hint of a greenish color here. The camera and the object didn't seem to be moving relative to each other very much, especially considering how long that exposure was. Courtney Lynn's camera was mounted on a tripod. And since the tree in the foreground remains a stationary reference point, Craig can determine that the object is moving relative to the fixed camera. That rules out that this is an image of a star or street lamp. If this was man-made uh, flare being shot from uh, the ground or dropped from an airplane, there'd be a long smear, a string arcing across the sky. We don't see anything like that. He compares this to an image he shot at the airport. 
We don't see any real obvious pulses of light here, uh, strobes, things to that effect. Nothing about Courtney's picture it says to me that this is an airplane or a helicopter. None of Craig's attempts at replicating or debunking the eyewitness photos have worked. The translucent rainbow coloring and light strings are curious. He turns his attention to replicating videotape recorded by Constable Leroy Gayton in Texas. He was using a single chip digital camera installed on the dash of his patrol car, normally used to catch drunk drivers, speeders, things of that nature. The car was parked and he then adjusted the aim point of the camera and zoomed in all the way, uh, going to 128 times normal using the digital zoom capabilities of the camera. And here we see some of the artifacts you'd expect to see of a distant object imaged with digital zoom where there's colors introduced that are actually not in the object itself. I don't believe the camera's capable of even focusing sharply on the distant object, and that's part of why we see this very large pearlescent sort of orb on this subject. Now, Craig reviews his video footage. These images were captured during our experiments with a consumer camcorder. And once again, we have a digital camera having a very difficult time adjusting to the intensity of the oncoming light source against a very, very dark backdrop. And as you can see, you're getting a very diffuse ball of light. I think it's pretty safe to say that the officer didn't record any airplanes or helicopters. Uh, there's no strobe lights, there's no anti-collision lighting systems that we're seeing whatsoever in the officer's video. But it's not a flying object in the traditional sense, in my opinion. Before the experiment, if you had asked me what are these amateur pictures really of, I think uh, I would have told you that they're going to be either stars, planets. These people saw something. It's something mysterious, to, to put it mildly. In 2008, scores of witnesses in three different states stepped out into the night and encountered nearly identical phenomena. Businessmen, homemakers, photographers, retired military, even police officers saw something unusual, something they had never seen before. The remarkable similarities in their testimony, videos, and photos suggest these people may have seen the same unidentified flying object in the skies above three different states. Expert analysis has determined some objects in the witnesses' videos as nothing more than conventional aircraft. However, radar and photographic evidence, as well as supersonic wind tunnel test results, point to the possibility that something else was up there as well. For the witnesses, there are only questions. It wasn't a star, it wasn't anything natural. It was too mechanical looking. Are they trying to put on a show for us? Are they trying to say, here we are? My personal thought, it had to be something not from this planet. We just want to know what it is. I'm hoping maybe the government can shed some light on this for us, because uh, the people of Steamville deserve to know what's floating above them. You start to realize, geez, we're probably not really the only ones here on this earth. And who and what is that? Are they watching me just as I'm watching them? It, uh, it really kind of scares you. It, it really does. We've always thought there's other people out in the universe. You have to be very narrow-minded not to think somebody's out there. But for the investigators, the search for answers continues.